You know, one of the first things a preacher wants to do before they're starting a sermon is to try to draw your attention away from them. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. We forgot earlier in the service to mention what all these eggs were doing in, in and around the worship center. And so I know I'm, I'm throwing a curveball at our AV guys here. And there are 12 eggs, and we put them especially there for the adults, but we pretend like it's for the kids. And so we want to invite you to see if you can find your own little virtual Easter egg hunt. See if you can find all 12. I got to confess, it took me a while to find all 12, and even though I'm right here in the sanctuary. Do your best with the camera shots that are coming up. That's actually, though, the perfect segue into a story that I want to tell you this morning. You know, I have been blessed to know one of the most inquisitive and free-thinking children ever. And um, she, when she was about four years old, she was talking to her parents, and she was playing with something at a, at a small table, and it was close to Easter time, and you could tell the wheels were turning. And she was playing, and she just kind of off the cuff said, you know, I'm not so sure about this whole Easter bunny thing, how the Easter bunny gets around and hides all the baskets and all the eggs. And then she went back to her play. And her parents, by this time, I think, had learned that it's best just to keep listening. Good lesson for parents. A little while later, she was still playing, and she said, and I think I've got the Santa thing figured out as well. Her parents said, hmm, okay, interesting. She went back to her play, and then all of a sudden she looked up, and she looked into the distance, and she said, I definitely think there's a tooth fairy. Nothing speaks like cold, hard cash, right? Well, actually, it was beautiful to see how faith and belief development happens. And you could see it right there in that child's eyes. And you could see the wheel. It's almost as if you could see the wheels turning in her brain. And the transparency of it was so beautiful. We as adults, on the other hand, are a little bit different. We tend to start to put up these veils over how we think about belief and faith. We're fed information and we try to figure out how we integrate that into what we believe and how we come to faith. And I got to say, it's not always successful. Like I said earlier, I've had a hard time at points saying, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. It's because it's kind of become stuck in the back of my throat at times. And like I said before, that's because I was taught that I had to believe in resurrection in a very specific way. And that if I didn't believe in resurrection in this very specific way, well, then I didn't believe. And if I didn't believe, then you know what that means, right? I was faithless. And I know because I've talked to many of you through the years that you were taught similar things. And that rather than building faith, oftentimes what that did was it tore it down and it made it harder. And so much to my relief as I went to seminary and as I studied scripture and in the years since as I've studied and read and talked to other people, I've seen the reality. And the reality is this, we come to faith in many different ways. And the awesome part is that it's right there in our scripture. Today we're going to look at John 20. We're going to look at how the writer of the Gospel of John articulates and had come to know the story of Jesus' resurrection. We're going to take a look at this in a couple of different segments. And so the first segment is verses 1 through 10. So you see it here on your screen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. When Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know and understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Some of us can say Christ is risen because we're like that beloved disciple. I like to call us the beloveds. For the beloveds, it just makes sense. He sprints to the tomb, he looks in, he sees an empty slab, and he thinks, oh, hallelujah, this is wonderful. He believes. And he believes not because he did some investigative research. He believes because it was almost intuitive. He just knew. He just understood. He came to belief and faith in that way. He didn't need to put his fingers in the hands of Jesus. He didn't need to speak to Jesus. So it was almost like he believed and knew all along. Some of us are like the beloved disciple. We're the beloveds. You know, there were, there's this passage in Melville's Moby Dick. And I know that most of us were assigned to read that in high school or college, one of those lit classes somewhere along the line. I'm not going to ask for true confessions in the uh, chat, in the live chat on the side. You can if you want, but I'm not asking for that, whether or not you actually read the book. But here's a Cliff Notes version of one particular part. Melville is describing the lantern that hangs in the captain's quarters. And no matter how stormy the seas, no matter how much that ship rocked and swayed to and fro, that lantern hung from a rope straight as an arrow. And Mel Melville says it was like it was drawn to the very core of the earth. Well, Easter, for that beloved disciple, is like that. It's an indicator. It's a pointer. No matter how much the earth, no matter how much the world is rocking and swaying to and fro, it is a pointer right to the core reality that Christ has risen. Some of us are beloveds. However, many of us are not. And so, Let's go back to the Scripture, shall we? We're going to look at the very next piece of Scripture from where we left off before. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. 
Well, some of us may be like the beloved disciple, beloveds. Others of us are a lot more like Mary. We'll call ourselves Marys. We come to see the risen Christ, but it takes us some time. Think back to the children's story and to the scripture that we just read together. Mary came to the tomb grief-stricken. She saw that the rock had been moved away. She went and told the disciples as fast as she could, then came back. They went in, then she went in, and she saw the empty slab. She saw the linens lying there. She even had this conversation with two angels. Seems to be a pretty big clue. And then she turns. She sees Jesus. She talks to Jesus. But she still does not realize it's him. I wonder how much of the time that is like our lives. In Mary's case, I think that she was probably so grief-stricken that it was almost like a veil clouded her entire vision. She couldn't see Jesus for who he was. How many times are we like that? Blocked by grief? Blocked by pain? Blocked by heartache? Heartbreak? Blocked by those things in our life that have hurt us. And sometimes I think we're not, not so much blocked by them as afraid to see what life will be like on the other side. It's become our comfortable place, even in its misery. In the scripture, Mary snaps out of the spell when she hears Jesus say her name. Mary. Mary. To which she responds, Beloved teacher, there you are. You know, I was in a church meeting just this past week, by Zoom, of course. We were in this meeting, and this was the group in the church that takes care of our building and grounds. So usually our meetings are pretty matter of the fact. We sort of get in and get out. We talk about what needs to be talked about. But this week took a little bit different turn. This week, one of our group members was courageous enough to be vulnerable with us. And he was sharing with us how close to the surface tears seem to be these days. And he was noting it in himself, and he was noting it in the people that he saw around him. And the group readily nodded their heads and understood exactly. We seem to be so worn down by the news, by the separation that we have to endure, by the stress. We seem to be worn thin to the point that our emotions are right there, almost tender to the touch. I think that's where Mary was. And you know what? I think that's exactly where we need to be sometimes in order to hear Mary, Greg, Pam, Eric, Josh, Jason. These thin places are places of vulnerability, but they're often, maybe especially, the places where God calls us by name. Some of us are beloveds. Some of us are Marys. And I know some of you might be thinking right now, you might be feeling a little left out. I'm not a beloved or a Mary. That doesn't fit me at all. Well, hang on. You know, if you read just the very next verses, we're not going to take the time to do that this morning, but I would encourage you to a little later today. I know you have nothing better to do anyway after you have Easter dinner with your immediate family. So after you have Easter dinner with your bubble, then go ahead and check out this scripture. And what you'll read is this. The disciples, self-quarantining, not because of a virus, but because they were scared to death, 
locked away in their upper room, that sacred, sacred space where they had eaten that last meal with Jesus, where he had washed their feet. Locked away in this room, afraid, because they had just seen Jesus executed, and they thought they were next. Now, in spite of what Mary has just told them, remember that from the last scripture? Mary told them that she had seen Jesus and all that he had said. They were locked away and scared. And then you got this one disciple. We know him as Thomas. Now, we know his more derogatory nickname, Doubting Thomas. That's never used in a positive connotation. Nobody ever wants to be a Doubting Thomas. You never say that in a good way. Thomas was out. And for some reason, we don't pay attention to the fact that they're all scared and holed up while he's showing the courage to be out and about. I don't know, maybe he was getting provisions for the rest of the gang. Well, Thomas comes back after the disciples had encountered Jesus in this room, and they say, Thomas, you'll never guess what happened. Jesus was here. It was awesome. To which Thomas says, what? No, seriously, he was here. He was here, right here, and he said, peace be with you, and he shared words with us about forgiveness. And Thomas says, have you guys been hitting the wine? I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I'm able to put my finger in the holes of his hands. Thomas wanted to see for himself, and you know what? He had that opportunity. Now, Thomas gets a bum rap. He shouldn't be called Doubting Thomas. The disciples, again, let's look at Scripture. The disciples had the opportunity to see Jesus, but before that, Mary had told them they were just as big a doubter as as Thomas was. And Jesus, in no way, condemns those who need to see before believing. In no way. He gives credit to those who do believe without seeing. But we're not second-class citizens, those of us who are Thomases, who need to see it with our own eyes and hear it with our own ears. We come to belief as well. You know, Thomas, this is the Thomas that went on to take the church, take the gospel all the way to India. He's the one now known as St. Thomas. Thomases have their place, too. Now, I know that most of us who are Thomases now, we don't have the luxury. We've never experienced those mystical moments with Jesus where we've been able to put our fingers in the holes in his hands, but we've had the parallel experience in the very here and now. We have seen the risen Christ. We have seen resurrection because we have seen lives that have been turned around. We have seen modern-day miracles. We have seen situations that look hopeless but somehow turn around and are like miracles. That's the risen Christ. We, see, we look outside right now and we see the earth coming to life. And we see God woven through all of that. We see flowers blooming. We look up at the sun and we have these big puffy white clouds And the sun just winks behind them, and I can't help but see that as God woven throughout our very lives. We have come to see the Lord as well. And you know, the biggest way that I feel like we Thomases see the world is in the love that is expressed. The love that we receive and the love that we are able to give. Think about this. Now, if you're somebody who's trying to cut down on the amount of news you ingest, well done, keep it up. But I would also add this. If you've just been watching the news to see what the latest number of cases is or what the latest number of deaths is because of COVID or coronavirus, I would encourage you to read a little further to all these great stories of love that are unfolding all around us. We've had tremendous opportunities as people to show one another love and to receive it. I can't help but think of people who are our medical professionals, who are taking the risk out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of service, but I think it's love. They are taking the risk with themselves and their families to serve people who are ill. 
People who are working in nursing homes, holding the hands, or at least figuratively, of those who are very close to death. There is love all around, and in that I see the risen Christ. And I say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, whether you're a beloved or a Mary or a Thomas, or maybe you're something else, and that's great. Because if Scripture shows us nothing, it's that we can come to faith in so many different ways. And no matter how you have come to faith, or whether you're not quite there yet. And if you're not quite there yet, I extend nothing but love and understanding because sometimes I am not quite there yet either. And that's okay. You know, here at Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren, we always start every service with the words that we practice, peace, service, and openness to all. And openness means a lot of things, and we'll talk about that in weeks to come. But for today, what I want to share with you is openness here. And I think this exists in our new virtual online community as well. When we say openness, what we're saying is that I'm where I'm at on my faith journey, and you're where you're at on your faith journey, and I have something to learn from you, no matter where you're at. Because we're in this together. And no matter what we mean, or no matter how we understand it, when we say Christ is risen, we're in it together. We are witnessing to that faith together. And all we need to do as we understand that is keep participating. And so if you're a beloved and you need to run to the tomb and just see and believe, wonderful. If you are a Mary and you need to pay attention to how you listen, fantastic. If you're a Thomas and you need to look and pay closer attention to the world around you, let's do it. And speaking of participation, closing words for sermon this morning, and I invite you to participate. You ready? Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Triumph for his foes. He rose a big.
dark domain And he lives forever with the saints to reign He rose, he rose Hallelujah, Christ arose How many Easter eggs did you find? I heard some people show that they saw seven, eight, I don't know, maybe you've, well, I got one in my pocket. Did you count that one? There it is. That's number 12, if you were looking for 12. We are so glad that you celebrated Easter with us today. You know, it was really neat. I just went back and I looked at some of the comments online. Um, someone reminded me this week that even though we're not able to celebrate Easter, we're Christians. We celebrate Easter every day of the year. That's what we're about. And Rebecca Dali said it really well. She said, most churches are empty today, and so is the tomb. We're really glad that you have joined us. I saw up to 380 people who were joining online. I don't know if anybody saw a higher number. That's fantastic. We're glad that you have joined us. And people from all over the states, but also some international folks as well. We're really glad about that. Uh, we do want to remind you that the chat is going to stay open for just a few minutes. If you want to stick around, you're going to see those Sunday best, those Easter best um, photos that are going to be scrolling through. So we hope you stick around. Those will be fun to see. Uh, I think we got upwards of, Jason, how many of those did we get? Uh, 82. We got 80 plus of your Sunday best uh, photos. So you definitely want to stick around and see everybody in their fun Sunday best. Next week, I also want to make sure to uh, announce that Pastor Eric is going to be preaching. He says that he will be taking virtual attendance, so you want to make extra sure that you show up for that and sign into the live chat. Uh, well, that's just what he said. I don't know about that. Friends, wherever you are, whoever you are, we celebrate Easter together. And I invite you to hear these good words of benediction. There are so many ways to say Christ is risen. When we say Christ is risen, we say he is risen indeed, even in times of despair and fear. When we say Christ is risen, we say we are made for times like this. When we say Christ is risen, we say we will protect and care for the most vulnerable among us. When we say Christ is risen, we know that we are redeemed to live. We know that we are able to run to the tomb, to listen for our name, to look for God moving all around us. Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Happy Easter, everyone.